minutes or so. So I'll be moving at the speed of light in order to do that. But I got to confess, it's easy for me to go 40, 45, even an hour with these webinars uh, sometimes. Just a couple things I, I want you to know about me. I think it's important to trust the source of the information, especially around pharmacy benefits. It's just so much misinformation is being shared from uninformed uh, people around the, the, the industry. So I want you to be able to trust what I'm going to tell you today. I've been in the business for two decades. I started out with a pharmaceutical manufacturer, eventually landing inside. I, I started out carrying a bag, pharmaceutical uh, drug sales rep, landed in the corporate offices where I led a team and it was an access team and we were charged with negotiating paying rebates to, to PBMs. So I've got that knowledge. I've also owned a mail order pharmacy. So that business in 2010 right when specialty drugs, it was clear that they were going to be be the future. I was frustrated by the reimbursements coming back from, from, from PBMs, uh, brand drugs, reimbursements, AWP minus 22. Uh, but they're on the other side, they're negotiating uh, uh, costs to the plan sponsor, AWP minus 14 or 15, keeping that huge, huge spread. And then also, negotiating with wholesalers and their master sales agreements kind of take it or, or leave it deals and so you, you know what if you can't beat them join them and we're going to do it different we're going to be transparent and then that's when i started uh transparent rx the the it may be still to this day i know there's more talk around the fiduciary model but we were the first to, to bring that the first mover to bring that to market uh and so that's a little bit about what we're going to be uh, discussing here today. If you have any questions for me, there's a couple ways to, uh, and, and by the way, I want to be clear here. Uh, this is not about uh, hyperbole. This is just about facts, sharing and exchanging notes, what I'm seeing in the marketplace from an insider's perspective. All right. So, so hang in there with me. If you have questions for me, you can send those questions to me via the chat option. Or if you prefer, you may raise your hand. There's that feature there on your control panel. Raise your hand. I will unmute you. And then at that point, uh, you will, will ha have the floor. And everyone has, has been muted for, for obvious reasons. So by the end of this presentation, I want three things to happen. Without engagement, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to change. We all know there, there's change that needs to take place within this industry. I want you to know how PBMs operate, how they make money beyond just overpayments. It's, it's, it's far more complicated than that. I want you to feel something other than indifference. And then I want you to begin the process of either for your company, uh, whether you are a consultant or advisor, or you work for a plan sponsor in an HR or a finance capacity, I want you to start eliminating information asymmetry. Obviously, price is a concern for self-funded employees, not just self-funded employees, but just payers in, in general of, 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 of pharmacy benefits. Even more so now, manufacturers are moving away from small molecule brand drug innovation. They're looking for those big complex molecules, those special drugs, those, those biologics where they can charge $10,000, $20,000, dollars $30,000 a month for those drugs that, that treat complex diseases. So while price is a concern, pharmacy benefit managers are leveraging information asymmetry. In other words, when one party has access to information that another party doesn't have access to, the party with the information is going to leverage it to its financial financial advantage. The party with the skills and the knowledge to interpret that same information is going to leverage it to its financial advantage. Pharmacy benefit managers are leveraging information asymmetry to make it difficult for its clients to calculate and determine 
how much money they are making. That's the key point. This is an example of information asymmetry, or in other words, information failure at play. This is not uh, unintentional. This is the advisor leveraging gamesmanship to take advantage of information asymmetry. On the surface, it makes sense. Hey, it's proprietary information. Uh, we can't get access to it. And that's the reason why we can't share it with you for you to be able to do what? Determine how the PBM is making money. More importantly, how much money it is actually making. Once a plan agrees to this level of transparency, little to none, game over. This is an example of information symmetry, the antonym of information asymmetry, or let's call information symmetry information success. As a fiduciary model PBM, when we pay out rebates to our clients, those rebates, first we say, we're not gonna keep any of this money. That's the first thing, right? right? And you have to put it in writing. And then you have to be able to provide that client with the means to verify that's what you're actually doing. It can't be talk. It has to be in writing. And then you have to be able to provide the client with the tools that they need to verify that that's actually what's happening. So when you look at this particular document here, this information here, plan ID, RX number, a National Association Boards of Pharmacy, which is the pharmacy identifier, same as NPI, all that information is populated when we send these reports out, which we, we just sent out the, the ones for, I think it was Q, Q3 of 2021, those rebates went out uh, this month. But that information is populated, but we've removed it here for privacy reasons. But you can see here, claim level detail for drugs that were eligible for a rebate. And then the key component, what was actually paid out on those rebates. The significance of this, we always talk about lowest net costs. It's one thing to talk about getting to lowest net costs or wanting lowest net costs, but how do you get there? And then when you do, what does it look like? This is what it looks like from a rebate perspective. This is information symmetry. So that leads me to the status quo. Plan sponsors enter into an agreement with a pharmacy benefit manager that calls for artificially too low administrative fees. Worse yet, they enter into an agreement with a pharmacy benefit manager where there's little to no transparency, no real transparency. That inevitably gives the PBM the green light to augment that artificially low admin fee in the back end through hidden cash flow methods, through those three buckets there primarily. When I speak of artificially low administrative fees, I'm not just talking about on the pharmacy benefit side, where you see some PBMs offering what, what appears on the surface to be a sweet deal. There's no charge for the administrative fee, or it's a, it's a dollar per paid claim, or 250 uh, uh, per member per month, uh, something something like that. That means the PBM is going to make its money. It's been authorized unknowingly to make its money through hidden cash flow methods, those three buckets there. That same gamesmanship is also at play on the medical side because you will often see PBM saying, hey, forego your rebates and we'll give you a credit on your medical admin, uh, administration fee. Same game, different name, all right? And this is a second example here. And, and I always like to put the sources of the information uh, uh, up on the screen uh, as, as well as I'm walking through this webinar. But some of you on this call will remember back in the early 2000s, the hesitation around generic drugs, right? Are they, are, were they as efficacious as their, their brand uh, uh, pr products? And, and so at that time, manufa P 
PBMs were making their money off the rebates from the small molecule brand drugs. You got smart. PBMs then shifted that cost. Remember, mandatory mail order here in phase two. PBMs shifted that lost revenue or cost to mandatory mail order. You got smart. You closed off that. Then PBMs shifted that cost to specialty drug rebates. And we're seeing that today. But now, if we come out here even further, 2020, 21, 22, PBMs have already moved the goal line. Now, they are focused on MBDCs, medical benefit drug claims. Not just the spreads in those drugs, but the rebates on those drugs as well. It is the wild, wild west, just as it was in phase one, two, and three. And we could even call this phase four now with the medical benefit uh, drug claims. And by the way, any PBM today, whether it's independent, carved out, carved in, uh, should be providing services in both benefits, both the medical and the pharmacy where prescription, uh, 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 where pharmaceutical drugs are concerned. And so it may sound like I'm bashing PBMs, I'm not. I just happen to believe that we offer a very valuable service. But my concern are the hidden cash flows to non-fiduciary PBMs that inevitably increase the cost for their clients. I believe PBMs should disclose and share how much money they're making, give the plan sponsor the right to determine whether or not they believe that cost is fair, all right? Now, it's important to understand the US reimbursement and distribution system. I'm going to first talk about and, and, and Richard, I see your question here. I'm going to try and get to that. And there's a couple of them. Try to get to that when we have a break in the action. Bear, bear with me. I'm on, I'm on a roll, Richard. I'm on a roll. So, so let, let's talk about the uh, uh, the let's talk about the, the contra contractual relationship first between PBMs and and pharmacies. PBMs, and I'm going to be focusing mostly on everything to the right side here. Um, as we draw a line through the middle of, of your screen there. But pharmacy benefit managers contract with pharmacies in order to have sites from which to have prescriptions made available to the PBM's plan participants. And then we have to have clients to provide these services too. Those clients are third-party payers, uh, self-funded employers, unions, uh, co coalitions, mu municipalities, if, you're, if your PBM is large enough, states and even, even the federal government uh, as well. Those are our clients. Now, when those prescriptions are dispensed, we reimburse the pharmacy, and I'm moving to the financial flow, we reimburse the pharmacy for those dispensed prescriptions, and then we bill our clients for those dispensed prescriptions. And this is where the games begin. So let's talk about three problems here. First, the inflow of cash in the form of rebates is too low. I just shared with you a couple different slides that show you that rebates or revenue from manufacturers account for as much as 50, almost 50% of a PBM's profits. The intent of rebate is to get to lowest net cost. So if a PBM is keeping part of those monies, and in many cases, too much of those monies, then the plan is overpaying. Now, the outflow of cash uh, in, the terms, uh, in terms of uh, what's being billed for the drugs, uh, here, reimbursement to the pharmacy, that is too high. The reason for that is something we call a spread. I'm going to show you a real world scenario on how spreads manifest. It may be different than what you believed it to be. Give me 30 seconds. 
the third problem here. Look who sits atop this entire system. Your clients do. You do. You sit here. You fund the entire system, yet know the least about how it works. That is the primary problem, and that's why we lead with education. Education makes all the difference in the world. I talked about spreads. So AWP, and by the way, I just posted uh, on our blog, and I'll share that with you here in a bit, um, uh, a blog post around AWP and how it's misunderstood. I don't think it's bad. You just have to understand what it is, how, where, and when to use it. So the drug pricing standard, which forms from the basis of discounted prices, is known as average wholesale price. In the pharmacy business, we refer to that as ain't what's paid, right? And so what I want to share with you here is generic drugs have two prices primarily, AWP, and that price will be some sort of discount off of AWP. AWP does not reflect any actual transactions in the marketplace. It is just a list price, kind of like the, the MSRP for a new automobile. And then you have the MAC price. That price does reflect uh, transactional data within, within, the market, within the market price. It is not a list price. It is a price. There's a price list. That price is the price. So let's take a look here how spreads actually work in the real world. So let's look at AWP here. That's the call. It's called a price benchmark. AWP is a price benchmark. Let's call uh, and we add here the second one, MAC, second price benchmark. Uh, levothyroxine, 100 uh, microgram tablet of 30. Now, take a look at the AWP. You see, and, and this goes, this is what I'm talking when I talk about. Uh, information asymmetry. Uh, plan sponsors are paying for drugs. They know what they're being billed, but aren't aware of even the starting point and how their costs are being determined, right? So uh, uh, in, unless they're looking back retrospect retrospectively. So look at levothyroxine here, 561 AWP. Let's call it 560. Now say, Richard, let's say you go in, you negotiate an 85% effective discount off of AWP for all generic drugs, right? 85% effective discount guarantee uh, off of all generic drugs. And let's just assume that that, that discount is radically transparent. All PBMs say that they're transparent and pass through, right? If that were true, we wouldn't be in the mess we are are in today around plans overpaying and 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 Congress having to get involved in prescription drug pricing legislation and all this stuff. If that were true, we wouldn't be where we are today. But let's just assume for the sake of argument that this 85% discount off of AWP is radically transparent. There's no hidden cash flows. There's no gain gamesmanship on the part of the PBM. That would mean that the discount off of this drug, let's keep it simple here, is 475. So that would mean that the plan would get a bill for $85. So 560 is the AWP, the discount is $475. The plan gets a bill for $85. Here's what I wanna show you, what the pharmacy paid what the pharmacy paid. The pharmacy only paid four bucks. That is it. Now, the pharmacy paid four and the PBM is gonna pay a markup on that four bucks. The, the pharmacy has to make money to keep the lights on. The, the, the farm D has to be able to pay their mortgage and, and send their kids to good schools, right? The PBM, if it is generous, pays 100% markup. And I can tell you, having been on the other side of the fence, that that doesn't happen. That doesn't happen 100% markup on the generic drugs. Pharmacies today, independents, 
are, are almost happy to make a 25% markup on the generic drugs. In many cases, they're underwater. So let's say this PBM is generous and pays 100% markup plus a dispensing fee, and let's just call it an even 10 bucks. Let's just call an even 10 bucks, the PBM is out of pocket. That leaves a spread, folks, of $75. Now, one could argue, hey, maybe this drug's cost, the benchmark being used, isn't AWP. Maybe it's MAC. But let's say that the MAC price is $15. The PBM's out of pocket doesn't change. It nets a $5 spread. That's how spreads take, uh, 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 take shape in the market. The state of Ohio, unlimited resources, very smart people uncovered a couple years ago in one year, just for one year, and this is public information, by the way, you can go out online and do a search for it. Uncovered in one year, almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads. The reason it was able to uncover a quarter of a billion dollars in spreads if Greg were here today, he would tell you to a woman or to a man that it was never information we've never had before, which was the problem. It was information we never demanded or thought to evaluate before. They wanted to know how much money the PBM was making. When it realized that it was make that these PBMs were keeping almost a quarter of a billion dollars just in spreads, they hadn't even looked at rebate dollars yet. They terminated the contracts essentially on the spot because they had deemed that amount of money to be unreasonable to pay for a PBM service fee. Misleading contract language. This is why the state of Ohio overpaid. If you believe you're not overpaying, you might want to reconsider that. I don't know, but there's enough evidence here to suggest if the state of Ohio can overpay, then anyone can overpay. The reason they overpay contract language, contract language. Let me say it one more time if it hadn't hit home. Contract language is the most important determinant of transparency and whether or not the amount a PBM's client, a plan sponsor pays is fair and reasonable or unfair and unreasonable. Two key points here, MAC list and then rebates. Let's fly through this. I'm, I'm already being long-winded, so let, let me pick up the pace here a little bit. The employer's MAC list will be less comprehensive and less aggressive than the pharmacy MAC list, right? So re remember in that spread pricing example I just walked you through where we use two price benchmarks, AWP and MAC. Did you know a PBM could have two different MAC lists, one for you and then one for the pharmacy? That's going to create a spread. That's going to create a spread. Rebates by many names in that U.S. pharmacy reimbursement and distribution model. I pointed out uh, that the cash flow uh, coming from the manufacturer to the PBM, from the PBM, to the plan sponsor is too low. I showed you two different slides from two reputable sources on how the PBM is generating almost 50% of its profits from manufacturer revenue. In other words, from rebates. 
one way that they do that is by renaming those dollars, relabeling those dollars, so that when the contract between the PBM and its clients doesn't account for those renamed rebate dollars, it now has the legal right to keep those dollars for itself. 10 years ago, and this, the federal court just ruled, you can go out online and check this as well. The federal court just ruled based upon a lawsuit that Anthem filed against Express Scripts, which is now a part of Cigna, right? filed a lawsuit after Anthem sold its PBM business to Express Scripts in 2009 or 10. They sold their PBM to Express Scripts only to later allege five or six years later that it overpaid Express Scripts by $3 billion for its pharmacy benefit. was a company that, oh, I know how. That was a rhetorical question. But it is gamesmanship like this that those things happen. It starts with the contract language. The reason I raised that point is, is that the federal courts ruled that Express Scripts, now Cigna, was not contractually obligated to pass those dollars back. Anthem had failed to secure radical transparency in its contract between it and Express Scripts. Here's an example here of some of these relabeled, renamed rebate dollars. This too is public information. Express Scripts sued Kaleo, um, this is about three years ago now that this was made public, but, but these claims go further back. But this was made public about three years ago. Express, Express Script sued Kaleo, which is a, a biologic, a specialty drug manufacturer, because Express Scripts alleged that Kaleo owed it rebate dollars that Kaleo refused to, to, to pay back to Express Scripts. I, listen, whenever a company sues a, a PBM, because it believes it's overpaid. I always know that the PBM is going to win that lawsuit. I, I always know that the PBM is going to win that lawsuit because of information asymmetry. They got the information and they have the knowledge, but their clients aren't on that same playing field. And then when they learn new, new information, it's too late. It's too late. I got no doubt that Kaleo owed this money, but the, the reason I'm bringing this up, the administrative fee here, folks, is not the administrative fee that I talked about earlier, the, the artificially too low administrative fee. This is a manufacturer administrative fee. This is the PBM sitting down with the manufacturer and saying, okay, you are giving us a bucket for just a single manufacturer, okay, you're giving us a bucket of $50 million. Remember, I've been at that table. You're giving us a bucket of $50 million, and we want $5 million to go to administrative fees, manufacturer administrative fees. We want $10 million to go to, to formulary rebates. We want another $5 million to go to price protection rebates. We want another $10 million to go to market share rebates. We want another $5 million to go to product discounts. The manufacturer is saying, here's what we're making available. How do you want to divide this up? And when your contract doesn't account for all of those revenues, the PBM profits from it. I talked about price protection rebates. Price protection rebates simply say this. If a, manu if, a, if, a, if a drug manufacturer increases the price of a product exponentially in a short amount of time, then, uh, and by the way, rebates uh, are indexed off of 
for the for the most part, not always. And that's one thing about pharmacy benefits. Rarely is anything absolute. I preface my comments. When I make a bold statement, you can put in front of that statement, generally speaking. Generally speaking, PBMs, uh, manufacturers index rebates on what's going to be paid off of WAC. That's a conversation for another day. That's a conversation for another day. But price protection rebates are drug manufacturer increases the product fairly rapidly in a short window. And because of that, with in the contract, it says that the rebate must also increase to coincide with your price increase. When it does, this is apart from the annual price increase that is indexed to WAC or wholesale acquisition costs. Here's another type of rebate, outcomes-based rebates, right? You, you, you know, you've heard, it's talk now about value-based reimbursement and, and value-based contract and things like that. That's this. That is this. And in the PBM's contracts, it'll be in fine print. And some of them will be bold enough to say that you're not entitled to these dollars. We get to keep these dollars. These are rebates. And they are massive. You've heard a little bit about, and I'm, I'm making pretty good on time here. Uh, you've heard a little bit about group purchasing organizations and, and rebate aggregators. Now, even the largest uh, PBMs have formed rebate aggregators that operate under a GPO or a group purchasing organization. And some of them are operating offshore. And instead of uh, now keeping rebate dollars, because remember that slide, I, how I, I showed you how you get smart and sophisticated and you cut that off and then the PBM shifts that cost is called ballooning. PBM shifts your cost somewhere else. Well, now it is GMF uh, uh, fees, right? GPO management fees is what, what they're called, GMF, Group Purchasing Organization Management Fees. So now instead of just uh, relabeling the dollars, uh, uh, you know, for market share or access or price protection rebates, now they can charge group purchasing organization management fees, ma fees to manage the rebate. Same thing, right? Same thing. The drug manufacturer is going to, we don't, we're only going to pay a certain amount. Where do you want us to place this money? We're going to pay for, for, for uh, refunds or rebates. So because you're cutting off those rebate dollars, getting smart, they have to shift that because they want to keep making that money. So now we're going to shift it and we're just, we're going to form these GPOs and we're going to charge GMFs or GPO management fees. So the bottom line here is that when evaluating a PBM, either you want to bring on a new PBM or you want to evaluate the incumbent, you must add as a metric, how much money is the PBM keeping in its bank account? When I go to a restaurant, I don't care how good the food is. You can't give me a menu with no prices on it. I love steak. I'm a meat eater, meat eater, folks. You can't give me a menu with no prices on it and then expect to just bring me a receipt at the end of the meal and have me pay it, not knowing what I'm getting myself into. I don't care if you have the best steakhouse in the world. That means you can charge me anything and I'm subject to pay it because I agree to eat your steak without first knowing what you are charging for it. Come on, people. You can't do that anymore. 
you can't enter into an agreement with a PBM without having any clue how much you're going to pay it for the services that they were hired to perform. The, the genius part of the, the non-fiduciary PBM revenue model is that what it takes home, what it puts in its bank account is hidden here in the plan's final cost. When you or your client overpay here or you are underpaid here, that increases this. And when you overpay in ingredient costs and underpay and are underpaid with rebates, it goes in the PBM's bank account. We have to stop this. If listen, if a, if a, if if I go to have my car repaired and they overcharge me, listen, no harm, no foul. It's just less money. It, it, I just have a little less money in my bank account. Healthcare is different. People end up in the emergency room. when they can't afford their insulin. It's bigger than just less money in the bank account. Stick with me for five more minutes. The CEO of CVS Health said this in an earnings call. And you have to read between the lines, and it just jumps off the page. Here. In layman's terms, what he is saying is this. We are going to make as much money as we possibly can. And, and, and by the way, underwrite contracts couldn't get past the third word without the word contracts having popped up he knows that that is the key to transparency he knows it anthem didn't know it We are going to make as much money as we possibly can. The amount of money that we are going to make is ultimately going to depend upon how sophisticated or unsophisticated our clients might be. That is what he is saying. And this is why so, see, my mom always said, boy, when you know better, you do better. It is tougher to accept mediocrity when you are extremely knowledgeable about a thing. I talked about the state of Ohio, and they said, nope, we're not going to allow you to keep a quarter of a billion dollars in spread pricing. And I said that they uncovered that because they pivoted. It was no longer just about discounts off of AWP. It was no longer just about negotiating for bigger minimum rebate guarantees. It became about how much, and th those are short-term solutions. They wanted a long-term solution to the, the, the prescription drug pricing problem. That long-term solution is how much money are you making? And we need a formula to be able to calculate that. You're looking at it on your screen. The tough part is getting the information that you or your clients need to calculate that number. I've talked about information asymmetry this entire time. 
everything in green at some point lands in the PBM's bank account. Cash disbursements, an example of that, let's go back to the, the US pharmacy reimbursement and distribution system model, that process flow. When a PBM reimburses a pharmacy, that's money out of their bank account, our bank account. When a PBM passes back a portion of manufacturer revenue, or in other words, rebates, money out of our bank account. Whatever is left over is the PBM service fee or its management fee. That's earnings after cash disbursements. So the new path says this, and listen, I want to be clear. A fiduciary model PBM, you can't get when it's really fiduciary. You can't get a higher standard of care than that. Can't. Right. So th that's. Uh, that's the goal, right? Th that's the ultimate goal. Is everyone going to be willing to, to uh, pursue that? No. Does everyone want that? Does every plan sponsor want that? No. It doesn't change what the ultimate goal is. But every plan sponsor can get radical transparency. The difference between the two, right? You, If you're a fiduciary PBM, you offer radical transparency. You can be a PBM that offers radical transparency, but not a fiduciary standard. Really, the primary difference between the two is radical transparency, one has to drive to that. Fiduciary standard, it doesn't matter how sophisticated or unsophisticated you are, the PBM is going to do the right thing by you, period, if it's truly fiduciary. Radical transparency, uh, if it's not a, P a fiduciary PBM that you're engaged with, then you have to drive to that. That requires you to have substantial knowledge about this thing that we call pharmacy benefits management. Example, business result. Going from, uh, let's call it a pass through transparent PBM. Okay, that's what they're going to tell you. To us, 60% drop in cost, essentially overnight. The, the second reason I want to share this with you, other than the difference when a PBM is truly fiduciary and radically transparent. I've talked about earnings after cash disbursement, how much money the PBM is keeping. No one's going to argue that Prime gets better deals than we do. Rebates and uh, cost of goods from pharmacies because they're just bigger. If that's the case, why is the cost lower with us? If, if you believe that their costs are lower than, than ours, then it's safe to assume, or equal, then it's safe to assume that their out-of-pocket should have been at $23.12, but it's $57. That $35 difference, folks, PM, PM, and that's horrible, is the earnings after cash disbursement. It was paying itself a management fee of $35 per member per month. And this is why it is so troubling is that that management fee is higher than the freaking drugs cost. That's what infuriates me the most is that they're charging more. People talk about, well, PBMs add cost to the supply chain. You know, they're, they're, but they don't know how that happens. This is how it happens. You see, I know everyone's skeptical. I know everyone's skeptical. You know, just another PBM just saying stuff and then does something completely opposite of what it said.
you're here because you want to make some sort of change, whether it's in your career, whether it's you want to do better uh, for your clients or for your company, or, or maybe it's both. Sometimes it is when you do better for your company, then ultimately that comes back in a good way to you. But you are aware that a problem exists. And you are intending to take some sort of action or modify your behavior. That, ha that action I want you to take is education. We offer the only, the first and the only program around pharmacy benefits that pulls no punches and shares the information and teaches you from an insider perspective how to be a better caretaker of the pharmacy benefit. Go out, read the testimonials. Reach out to people on LinkedIn. Ask them, is what he's saying true? And they will tell you yes. The next class starts June the 2nd. Eli Bro, just listen. Uh, here's a point. Got nothing to do with me. Graduated from Michigan State Business School. Our business school was named after him. I didn't know who he was until several years after I graduated and decided to figure out who is this cat? Why is the business school named after him? Turns out he's the only person in, in the world, and Elon Musk at some point might be, to be the founder of two Fortune 500 companies. Not the CEO, the founder, KB Homes and Sun Life Financial. If he believes education is the key to skyrocketing health healthcare costs, who am I to question that? There's something there to that. I talked about the car repair scenario for a reason. Most of my professional life, right out of college, from Michigan, in Michigan, I know nothing about cars. As an adult, professional, working in Michigan, I know nothing about cars. The home of cars in the United States, manufacturing. When I go into a dealership or a car repair shop to have my automobile repaired, I know I'm at a disadvantage. I don't know jack about cars. So I go in, chest sticking out, pounding my fist on the desk, you're recommending services that I don't need, and here are what, here's what I think I do need. Inevitably, I turn down services that I need, and I accept those that I don't, and I'll even end up on the side of the road because of it. The only way around that is take someone in with me who's an expert, in car repair, or I'm dealing with a radically transparent car repair shop. The faking it till you make it doesn't work when it comes to pharmacy benefits. Either get educated about it or have someone on your team who is an expert. Not the people who say, I know enough just to be dangerous. You might not know this, but that is dangerous. Don't be like me. Don't stick your chest out trying to pretend that you know about fixing cars. Get educated. That's my time today, folks. Uh, I might have one or two questions coming in. Uh, 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 
Do you find that consultants are participating in rebate profits? Yes, particularly around coalitions. Um, how are rebates shared on drugs? And the, the medical benefit, if the people special pharmacy isn't used? Well, first, good point. Obviously, there are medical uh, benefit drug rebates. The problem is those dollars aren't getting passed back to the, to, to the client. And when the PBM owns a specialty pharmacy, there's all sorts of conflicts of interest with that. They want to keep those drugs flowing through the specialty pharmacy, obviously for spread pricing and rebates, and then also uh, uh, the fees that manufacturers pay for the data flowing through uh, uh, specialty pharmacies. And then the second piece of that is, you know, all these different manufacturer programs that are available. Um, plant sponsors can't take full advantage of those when the PBM also owns the specialty pharmacy. Uh, and so listen, this is not, uh, again, I'm telling you my professional opinion. That doesn't mean, listen, if someone wants to pay more, a certain PBM makes them feel better, the brand recognition, whatever it is, and they are okay with paying that, they have all the data, fine. But understand the pros and cons. Um, uh, could plans go direct to the pharmacy and cut out the PBM? There's some of that going on. There's some of that going on. Uh, I'm going to give you two, two sides of that. Good RX, we talk about this in the CPBS program, by the way. We lay it all out. Uh, I'm not one of those people that are, just talks about things that benefit me. Right? Good RX is doing some of that today. And Will it lower costs? They've got some neat programs that they're doing. I'm not going to lie to you. They got some neat stuff that they're doing to try to bring down drug costs. Uh, could some plans benefit from that? Absolutely. Going directly to the pharmacy uh, 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 is not just a way to substitute electronic claims processing. It is a way to offer a pharmacy benefit. There's some challenges involved with that. Um, but GoodRx is, is, is doing some of that stuff today, and they've got some neat programs as the technology catches up. The only thing that I will say to that is, is now your clinical programs go away. <laughs> now your clinical programs go away. Not to mention, you can do a search. Uh, pe people say PBMs are bad, but you can do a search uh, and find out that, that, that pharmacies aren't perfect either. And so we have to keep a watchful eye when we do audits on claims being submitted. Are these real claims or are these ghost claims? Yeah, Richard, that, that last question, um, I'm not sure. I'd have to have more information on that. I, you know, I don't want to you know, give an answer without the complete inf information on that. There's a lot that, that goes into that. 